Hello, options traders, and welcome, everyone. I wanted to post a video here on vertical spreads and some of the key points, such as your max gains, losses, and break-evens. And I've had a number of traders saying, you know, it's a little confusing with all of these different formulas on vertical spreads. And I totally agree. I'm not a big fan of trying to memorize formulas. I'd rather see that you understand the principles. And when you do that, you'll be able to figure out these key points in your head. So let's take a look at vertical spreads and how to figure out your max gains, losses, and break-evens without needing formulas. The first thing to understand is that if you buy an option, the most you can lose is the amount you paid. That is true whether you buy an individual option, buy a call, buy a put, or if you buy a spread. If you buy a vertical spread, the most you can lose is the amount you paid. If you buy a diagonal spread, the most you can lose is the amount you paid. So that's always important for the debit spreads or the ones that you're going to pay for. On the other hand, if you sell an option, the most you can make is the initial credit that you received. Now, another thing that you need to understand is whether your spread is a debit or a credit. And this is where most traders start to find it really confusing. And they say, I can't figure out if it's a debit or a credit spread unless my broker's platform tells me so. Well, there's an easy way to do it if you understand some basic pricing principles. There are a lot of what are called pricing principles in the options world. And these are just different price boundaries that have to occur for options, and they will greatly help you to understand strategies. But the one that you need to understand for now for your vertical spreads is that lower strike calls must be more valuable than higher strikes. And then as a corollary, we could say that higher strike puts must be more valuable than lower strikes. So what exactly does this mean? Well, for instance, let's say that we're looking at the May $50 call and the May $55 call. These are for the same stock. We've got the same expiration here in May. We're just looking at two different strikes. Without even looking at option prices, I can tell you for sure that the May $50 call is trading at a higher level. Why? Because a $50 strike is lower than a 55. Lower strike calls must be worth more money than the higher strikes. On the other hand, let's say that we're looking at the May $50 put and the May 55 put. Once again, it's the same stock, same expiration, just two different strikes. Without even looking at a broker's platform, I can tell you that the May $55 put must be trading at a higher value. It will definitely cost more than the May 50. The reason that we know that this principle has to hold is there's another principle out there called arbitrage. And arbitrage is a type of a trade generally carried out by computers today. And it results in a guaranteed profit. It's always nice. But it's even better than that because it doesn't even require any cash outlay. It finances itself. So arbitrage in the finance world is literally like finding money lying on the ground. It's just free money. Somebody has to go out there and pick it up. And the way that you pick this up is to do this arbitrage trade. The problem is, is that the arbitrage undoes the very benefit. So if for some reason we saw that May $50 call trading, even if for just a split second, at a lower price than the May 55, we know for a fact that the arbitrage would start to kick in and the act of the arbitrage would undo that. It would force that May $50 call to trade at a higher value than the May 55. So it's this process of arbitrage that actually guarantees that these principles have to hold. So if you don't believe it, let's take a look. I've chosen Microsoft here, but choose any stock that you'd like or index. Choose any expiration date that you'd like. So here I've got the July 19 expiration, and you can see there's 75 days till expiration, but it doesn't matter. You could pick the weeklies, pick anything that you'd like. But take a look at the strikes down the center here. I've got the 100 strike on top, and they progressively get higher down to the 155 at the bottom. Let's first go over to the call options, and we're going to use the mark, which is the halfway point between the bid and the ask. So right here is our mark, and take a look at the 100 strike, trading for $29.12. But if we go to the 105 strike, 
it's 2440. The next strike down is 1955. 1497, 1072, 705, look at this, 4, 2, 96 cents, 41 cents, 17 cents, and 9 cents. They get progressively cheaper as we move toward the higher strikes, which is to say lower strike calls must be worth more money. Let's jump over to the opposite side of the board and take a look at the puts. Here is the mark for the puts. At the top, the 100 strike, 19 cents. The 105 is 33 cents. Continuing down, we've got 56 cents, 96, $1.67, 296. Look at this, 5, 8, 12, 16, 21, 26. They get more expensive as we move toward the higher strikes. And the reason this is happening is because of that pricing principle. Higher strike puts must be worth more money. So for any stock or index, you're going to notice that your call options are going to get more expensive as you move in this direction toward the lower strikes, and your put options will get more expensive as you move in this direction toward the higher strikes. Let's run through a couple of examples, and I'm going to use the 125 and the 130 strikes right here. And again, over here at the mark, they're trading for roughly $7 and $4. So I'm just going to use those as round numbers just to make the examples easier. So let's say that we decide to buy the July 125 call. That's going to cost us seven. We are going to sell the July 130 call, which means we would receive $4 back. So the net between those two, or what we would call the net debit, would be three. How do I know that it's a debit trade? because we bought the more valuable strike. We bought the 125 call and sold the 130. We know for a fact it has to be a debit trade. So in this case, we would say that we bought the 125, 130 vertical spread for $3. So the next thing to understand is that when you buy a vertical spread, you have an asset that's important. That means this spread may increase in value. And the largest value it could ever be is the difference in strikes. That's what you're buying. You bought an asset, you paid money for it, and just like any asset, when you buy it, you are hoping that it goes up in value. And that is exactly what happens with a debit spread. So in this example, if we paid $3 for it, we know the maximum we can lose is three. And take a look, this is where your profit and loss diagram lines up right there at minus three. What's the maximum gain? Well, go back to your principles about rights and obligations, one of the most fundamental things of options. If you buy an option, you have a right. If you sell an option, you have an obligation. So if we bought the 125 call and sold the 130 call, what did that do for us? We have the right to buy the shares at 125, we have the potential obligation to sell the shares for 130. So think about it. If we buy the shares at 125 and we sell them at 130, the maximum we could ever make is the difference of $5. We would need, in this example, the stock to go to at least 130 or higher to make that $5 value. But equally important, it doesn't matter how much higher that stock goes. It could go to 135, 140, 200, you know, it just doesn't matter because we have the obligation to let it go at 130. So if the very most this spread could ever be worth is five, but we paid $3 for it, then the maximum gain is two. And if you look at your formulas, it's going to say for a debit spread, the maximum gain is the difference in strikes minus the debit. And now hopefully it makes sense as to why. What about the break even? Well, if you bought a call spread, you must have purchased the more valuable strike. And that means the break-even formula is exactly the same as it is for a long call option. So if we buy the 125 call for three, I need that stock price to rise $3 in order to break even. So we just take the 125 strike plus the $3 debit, and that gives me a break-even point of 128. So if the stock is 128 at expiration, how do we break even? Well, my long 125 call is worth three. My short 130 is worthless. So when I close out the spread, I would receive a net credit of $3. I paid three, I received three, I just break even. 
But if the stock is anywhere above 128 at expiration, I begin to make gains, and if it's 130 or higher, I make my maximum gain of two. All right, now let's take a look at another example. We're going to look at a credit spread, the person who sells this vertical spread. For every trade, there has to be somebody on the other side of the trade. That's what makes it completed. You have to have a buyer and a seller. So if we bought the 125, 130 call spread, somebody somewhere had to sell it to us. So that trader would have the opposite set of transactions. And let's say this person buys the July 130 call, spends three, but sells the July 125 call and collects seven. This person has a credit spread. They receive a net credit in this example of $3. So why was it a credit spread? Because they sold the lower strike call. They sold the more valuable option. Now, sometimes people say, ooh, credit spreads are better because it's better to receive money than to spend. And as I show in Strategy Lab, that is absolutely not true. In fact, debit spreads and credit spreads both result in debits to your account. So don't get hung up on the word credit. There are different reasons why we might choose the credit spread over the debit, but the fact that we're receiving money is not one of them. So you have to understand that with credit spreads, and in this case, when you sell a vertical spread, you have a liability. Remember, when we bought it, it was an asset. See, there's a difference. Yes, of course, market traders will pay you money for putting on a strategy, but they're not going to pay you money for taking an asset. They will pay you money for accepting a liability, and that's what's happening here. And that means that this spread might decrease in value. See, when we bought the spread, it might increase, but when you sell the spread, it might decrease. That doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you can't look and say, ooh, credit spreads, credits, credits. Always take the credit spread, it's better. Simply not true. You're getting a vertical spread, which is a liability that might decrease in value. And that liability equals the difference in strikes. So in this example, the trader who sells the 125, 130 spread or sells this credit spread would have a risk graph at expiration that looks like this. Notice that they're bearish. Everything between the buyer and the seller must be opposite. The person who bought the 125, 130 vertical spread was bullish. The seller must have the opposite outlook and be bearish. They both can't make money if the stock rises. They both can't be debits. They both can't be credits. They are always opposite. So now think about your transactions. This trader sold the spread for the $3 credit. Where did he get the $3 credit? That was the $3 debit that you paid. The brokers just transfer the debit from one trader to another. So yes, this person receives a $3 credit. But now think about the rights and obligations. This person has the right to buy stock at 130 because he's long the 130 call and he has the obligation to sell shares at 125. Well, what does that do for you if you buy stock at 130 and sell it at 125? The maximum value, or at least in terms of the absolute dollars that you could lose, is that $5 difference. There's no asset in there if you're paying 130 and selling for 125. It's a potential $5 liability. However, if you received $3 up front in exchange for accepting a $5 liability, then the maximum loss would be the $2 difference. And if you look on your broker's platform, it's going to tell you that the formula for a credit spread for the maximum loss is the difference in strikes less the credit. And now you see why. What's the break even point? It's exactly the same formula as it would be for a short call option. We have effectively sold the 125 call for $3. And so we have a $3 cushion if that stock price should rise. So I can afford to have the stock price rise $3 above my 125 strike, which puts us right here back at 128. So one thing you're going to find with strategies is that the buyer and the seller, or the long and the short position, always share the same break-even point. Now, interestingly, I could also figure this out synthetically. 
Even though this was technically a $3 credit for the trade, I could pretend that it was a debit trade over here for two. And synthetically, this side of the profile right here looks like a put option. And synthetically, it is. So if I bought the 130 put for two, I would need the stock price to drop by $2 below my 130 strike and puts me right back to a break even of 128. But regardless of how you come up with the answer, why will we break even here? Well, if the stock is 128 at expiration, the short 125 call is worth minus three. We have to spend $3 to close it out. The 130 call that we're long is worthless. So the net debit to close out this trade would be $3. Person received $3 at front, spent $3 to close it out, and he breaks even. Now the big question I'm sure everybody has, well, should you use debits or credits? Which is best? Well, as is true with all strategies, there really is no best. There's simply differences in risks and rewards, and that can easily be shown by any risk graph. But the reason that your professional traders choose between the debit spread and the credit spread comes down to skews and to what we call the ease of potential morphs. And that's where the art and science of options trading comes in. For those who'd like to learn more about the art and science of options trading, please check out the brand new Strategy Lab for 2019 at optionsa-z.com. Also, please join us on the Facebook trading group, Options A to Z, and you can find a link in the description below.